Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stu again, and this is Stu's News, a review of American High Speed Rail happenings over this past month. In this video, we'll take a look at April of 2023. Let's start with California High Speed Rail, since they have a Finance and Audit Committee meeting just about every month. Capital Outlay Budget Summary, we can see they spent $102.8 million in February of this year. That is way too slow. In linear math terms, it would take them 18 years to finish Merced to Bakersfield and 93 years for Phase 1 at this pace. That is if they had the money to do either. A fiscal year forecast and expenditures chart. You'll notice they missed miserably on the first six months of the fiscal year and are off to a great start in January and February after resetting expectations in December of 2022. And by the way, this isn't because they don't have money, they have about a billion and a half in cash. Design build expenditures chart showing the relative lack of growth in expenditures going toward actually getting things done. This chart shows that they have managed to blow through the entirety of their $4 billion slush fund, I mean risk contingency, and have now added about $2 billion more. One bright spot, they did manage to bring 300 construction workers back to work and are now roughly at the level attained at the end of 2022. Construction progress showing just how low they are aiming and just how slowly they're completing. I swear I didn't edit this. This chart shows they plan to finish one mile of right-of-way and seven structures this year. Good news is they managed the mile of right-of-way, but only two structures completed in eight months so far. Utility Relocation Summary and Right-of-Way Summary, using these to show they are meeting the extremely slow present schedule, but are astonishingly close to slipping. In the press, portions of construction have been severely impacted by recent flooding in California's Central Valley. Tulare Lake deserves a video of its own, and there are plenty on YouTube, so I'll skip the history lesson. Let's just say that Tulare Lake is normally dry and used as farmland. In very wet years, when the dams on the Cahuilla and Tule Rivers can't hold back adequate amounts of water, portions of the lake bed flood, as do areas around the rivers. This happens about every 20 to 30 years. The California High Speed Rail right-of-way is the red and purple roughly north-south line, and it runs right along the edge of the lake bed for about 15 miles. The purple portion represents about 20 miles of California high-speed rail right-of-way that has been affected by flooding so far. The worst is yet to come as significant flows of water are expected to continue in the area through at least May. When the lake floods like this, it can take years to dry up, so who knows the exact extent of the damage and how long the project will be affected. One other issue is that the valley along the eastern side of the lake has sunk something like 60 feet and is continuing to sink. That's part of the reason the flooded portion extends out of the historical basin to the east. California High Speed Rail will have to deal with this on a continuing basis. In other news, some conceptual renders of the initial Central Valley stations from a platform's eye view have been released. The architectural firms working on this are Foster and Partners and Arup. Good luck with uh, this design on a rainy day or if it's 100 degrees at 5 in the evening. That wraps up California High Speed Rail for April. Let's move on to Brightline West. Lots of Brightline West press dropping in the last week right after my Brightline West videos, naturally. Forbes has a new interview up with West Eden's co-founder of Fortress Investment Group, which owns Brightline. Interesting read. A couple of new tidbits. According to this article, the new cost estimate of Brightline West is $12 billion. That's up a couple of billion. Anyone want to bet on at least $15 billion out the door? Also, some updated funding details to go along with that. Brightline is hoping for three and three quarter billion dollars from the federal government and plans to raise the rest through private investment. A couple of examples of articles about congressional support for Brightline West. Naturally, Nevada is completely behind the idea. California? Not so much. The support there is mainly from the regions set to directly benefit, like San Bernardino County. I'm guessing this is due to the funding conflict with California High Speed Rail. Also, as I've mentioned in other videos, California is fairly fractured politically, and it's nearly impossible to get it to move in unison on anything. 
You've probably noticed some new renders in these articles at about three hours after I finalized my Brightline West Apple Valley to Las Vegas driving tour video these dropped. This was actually a major motivator to start this new series now so I can show these. These renders are of the Las Vegas station on Las Vegas Boulevard about three miles south of the Las Vegas Strip. Looks pretty good. It certainly looks better than what's there now. It's not clear what all Brightline will do with the 110 acres it owns here. The area has some exciting speculations surrounding it, including the possibility of adjacent stadiums, arenas, and casinos. I have this under Brightline, but it pertains to California High Speed Rail as well. California has dedicated about $15 million toward the design phase of the High Desert Corridor. This is the right-of-way of a freeway that will no longer be built that Brightline would like to eventually use to connect their Brightline West Line through the Victorville area to Palmdale, which would host a California high-speed rail station if that project ever manages to get there. Now let's switch over to Texas Central. As far as I can tell, Texas Central is pretty much toast, but this opinion piece was fascinating to me. Basically says Texas should learn from California and the mistakes it has made with California high-speed rail. However, a main mistake of California's was not building the thing 40 years ago when it would have been easier to get done. Also, California high-speed rail in Texas Central is an apples to oranges comparison if there ever was one. Public versus private, California high-speed rail is three times more track. California has massive terrain challenges. Texas is wide open and nearly flat. I could go on and on. I've had people ask me to do a Texas Central video. I will likely get around to that eventually, but the too long didn't read version is that Texas is a little wacky for not building this thing. Speaking of wacky, while researching this video, I ran across the Texans Against High Speed Rail Facebook group. Imagine being against an entire mode of travel just cuz. Now let's see what's going on with Acela and the Northeast Corridor. Turns out a lot, but also not much. Of course, Amtrak received $22 billion in the 2021 infrastructure bill, and about half of that will go toward the Northeast Corridor and Acela. As far as what has happened in the last month in that regard, all I found was this article about the procurement phase of the East River Tunnel Rehabilitation. This runs under the East River between Manhattan and Queens in the Northeast Corridor. Construction is set to start next year and take about four years. After reading this article and exploring the Amtrak site, I found something funny that sort of sums up the state of high-speed rail in the United States at the moment. Under major projects, if you click the future of rail link, you get a 404 error. Very fitting. I tried asking Julie, my virtual assistant, but seems she's not working at the moment. I know there are other nascent projects out there and probably information I missed, but I do plan to have this be a series I publish at the end of each month and plan to expand coverage, so stay tuned. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big beautiful freeway.